Brilliant news, everyone. A game that is bloody beautifully designed is doing fantastic in the market. Now, we do have a funny for you today in that Elden Ring has made a few Horizon developers kind of lose their marbles mm -hmm. in a way that is informative yep. to the... Maybe the difference in East and West, one of the reasons why there is so much fucking just charm and beauty within you know, within Elden Ring, yeah. that, uh, well, I think there's a certain tweet that absolutely kind of shoots a bit of Horizon in the back of the head. <laughs> yeah. By the way, Horizon's still a brilliant game. Oh, absolutely um, wonderful. But it's very funny. And we're going to get into that. First, mm -hmm. though, let's just talk about how the sales and the score yeah. both tell a story. And yeah. I mean, the context here, Matt has been playing so much Elden Ring yeah. the last week and a bit. You are singing its praises on a daily basis. That means there's no surprise that its sales were 2.5x that of Horizon Forbidden West. That is, of course, though, UK. And it is also yeah. on console. Now, that said, these are like-for-like -like numbers. Yeah. This is the same data source last week to this week. Now, within this data source, what, you know, it... It yeah. could just amplify this game particularly or whatever. It's not reflective of the American market, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the game is doing bloody brilliantly. So it's the biggest UK video game launch since Call of Duty Vanguard, according to GSD. 2.5x Horizon Forbidden uh, West. It's the biggest launch outside of COD and FIFA since Red Dead Redemption 2. That, that, that That's insane. That's massive. It's, I mean... Uh my local game was sold out. They wouldn't accept, they wouldn't, I didn't pre-order. I went to buy it. They wouldn't give me a copy because they were holding for pre-orders. I don't think I've seen that happen to a game in years. Yeah. It's week one sales. Bigger than Cyberpunk 2077. Yeah. Bigger than Valhalla. And that is just, that's oh, incredible. Yeah. For Steam, the sixth peak of all time and currently at the you know, time of writing third. But there's something hidden in that peak mm -hmm. because sure, Lost Ark was just behind PUBG. Yeah. But Lost Ark got its 1.3 million concurrence with, like, you know, many thousands of people stuck in the queue. Yeah. So what the queue will do is it will turn demand over a day into concurrency in an artificial-ish manner. Whereas for Elden Ring, you want to play Elden Ring, you click play, you're in Elden Ring. Yeah. Which makes this number all the more impressive. Yeah, so but it's yeah. madness. Yeah, in terms of real people actually literally all hands on controller playing the game at the same time, Elden Ring is definitely fifth because you can discount Lost Ark, which means it's comparable to Cyberpunk. And yeah. I think Cyberpunk had a stronger PC market than on console by a substantial margin, especially because yeah. those versions didn't have a next-gen one and the uh, last-gen one was terribly, terribly optimized. Just basically, well, they pulled it from sale, you know that story, but like that means Elden Ring's probably bigger than Cyberpunk substantially across all markets because if it's, if it's the same on PC and beating it on console. Yeah, we are... Actually looking at one of the greatest video game launches of all time. Yep. And this is where it gets interesting and uh, other developers get a little bit mad. Yeah. <laughs> right then. Developers are so in the weeds they cannot understand players. And I'll tell you what. I will tell you what. And I cannot say, I mean, you know who, but yeah. I cannot say publicly or anything because, you know, you, you don't want to talk about what your friends have said to you. Um, I definitely know of a situation that is totally this of... Mm. Someone who is one of us, who enters game industry, sees people in AAA studio who are more tenured, and is like, "What? <laughs> you, you, you got no, get, no gamers don't like that. That's the problem. I can't mm. even say what the thing is because it could be identifying. Mm. Um, but that's the thing. And within big game companies, I, you know, there are just some developers who are closer to the front line." Yeah. I don't mean the front line of development. I mean the front line is in they're closer to the players and you just feel it. You just know it. And you know what? I've talked to a few of them and I know some of what their perspectives are like when they talk about actually working at the company. And, you know, they almost have to be the standard bearer for their players mm -hmm. because there are the people who just get disconnected. And this is what we're talking about here. So we got to talk about it, right? And uh, look, these are tweets that these people put out publicly on Twitter, a public platform. So the scrutiny is going to happen. Now, I think there's probably a few lockdown accounts and things like that going on. But honestly, these are the people making our games. They are tweeting their thoughts about these games. I think it is important to talk about, to bring up important issues. And we have to get into it. Yeah. So, uh, Ahmed uh, starts off by saying, The fact that Elden Ring scored a 97 Metacritic is proof that reviewers don't give a flaming poop about game UX. My life is a lie. He's a UX designer. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca, nor PC graphics, stability, and performance, apparently. And then Blake here, 
<laughs> nor quest design, really. And I think that means, honestly, mm -hmm. I think the person who absolutely comes off the worst here is Blake. Yeah, Because I, I can sort of understand more about what Ahmed and Rebecca are saying. Yes. But this, if this is reflective of AAA thoughts and quest design, then, like, I think we both are yeah. looking for the next window that we can just walk out. Yeah. I mean, immediately my thought is, if you don't, if you think, Elden Ring's quest design and Dark Souls quest design in general is, then you must think quest design is designing a to-do list for players to check off mentally as if they're doing their fucking grocery shopping as opposed to having an adventure in a world. Yeah. You must think that <laughs> quest helper. Yeah. Because uh, one of the things people loved about WoW Classic mm -hmm. is you could read the quest text and you'd be like, okay, cool. I need to go to the west and then go over there. Yeah. You could actually navigate and learn. Now, obviously what happens is our goopy gamer brains turn on because that's an MMO. And we're like, fucking Jimmy and my guild is leveling faster. I need to go better and beat him. Mm -hmm. That's just how we are in MMOs. But one of those things for so many people at the start of Classic that made it so fucking magical was making your way through that world yep. without the quest markers, without all of that. It meant you actually, you explored. You ex actually explored. Yeah, that, that's... <laughs> That's exactly what you do in Elden Ring. You explore. You don't explore in most other AAA games. You go to waypoints. No, you do exploration you, yeah. content. Mm, exploration yeah. <laughs> gameplay and exploration content. Yeah. Which is, so it is basically a thing to do, an activity to do, a type of thing to collect, rather than a, a verb. Mm -hmm. Right? A verb of gameplay. That's what Elden Ring fucking gets. <laughs> and I think that's why we need to talk about this shit. So number one, by the way, I'll just mm. certainly say... This is bad form. Yeah. This is kind of, I feel like kind of bad form, you know, for, for devs to be sort of talking about other devs, uh, you know? Uh, uh, so, okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's calm down and get into it. <laughs> Elden Ring's UX is so bad that I can only imagine from soft devs smoking at their desks and using CRT monitors. And if that's how they made this game, then you should start smoking and use CRTs. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Someone's salty that they that they work for an open world sandbox generator that makes uninspired games. Ubisad, be sad, huh? Yep. Indeed. Oh, nothing better than a good savage furry account. Mm. Uh, so <laughs> this is this is it. Yeah. Uh, this is Horizon Forbidden. I can't do a funny, whatever. But this is it, right, man? Yeah. We message of the day. New items available in the Elden Shop. Purchase the epic Kingslayer set from Game of Thrones and become the Golden Lord for $9.99. Of course, you know, you might be playing the game and thinking, where are the enemies? Yeah. Well, that's okay because the <laughs> UX designer has flown in and given you a beautiful wee compass so you can know exactly where everything is. Yeah. Well, Tarnish I mean, sense. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't that, wouldn't that make your exploration gameplay so much easier by highlighting all the things you want to find with a convenient glow? And then maybe you could even mark them or pin them and put them in a little, uh, you know, put them in a little checklist. That would be great. That would be very, very helpful. And I would have finished Elden Ring about uh, 20 hours ago and not cared about it at all. Yeah. Yeah. Do you not, do you want to be playing Elden Ring with, you know, a little, uh, you know, a little marker for your main quest, a little oh. boss fight marker? And of course, knowing, you know, how many eagles have I collected in this area? And we kind of say this because Elden Ring is stripping back all the bullshit and it's having a world. You are one with your character. The more UI elements like this that exist, that is more layers of abstraction yeah. of, of what your character is doing. That is pulling the player and the character further away because even though it's a third-person game, in Elden Ring, like, you see what your character sees in a way. Oh. Whereas here, it's like, no, you're controlling your character with a full heads-up display. Yeah. I mean, even uh, even on, on the idea of character, Elden Ring does such an incredible job of actually actually engaging with the player substantially more than... Um, you, know, the, you know the way where, you know, you have an RPG character and it's your character... And the game, the games have always struggled with treating it like an actual character. You'll get the likes of Marwyn and Skyrim do okay, sort of a little bit of that. A little bit of Cyberpunk does okay. But then you see all of the like really over-the-top stuff that open world games do with the named main character. Having the actual RPG element of it's your character and you've got so much freedom actually adds to that. And they do such a great job at this time. It's insane. And I love how 
a game without yep. a big triple A expensive marketable protagonist. Yep. Has completely just eaten everyone's lunch or oh, dinner, yeah. whatever, taking their lunch money. And oh, I just think that's really good for the industry actually because it does show that, you know, the silent protagonist, mm. the you know, the the protagonist that is a you know, something the player can kind of insert themselves into. Yeah. That is still a big marketable, marketable concept. Mm -hmm. Because I, I feel like what what works and what kind of gets greenlit in games is situations where you make a relatable character that people can be drawn to yeah. by the marketing. Yeah, you make a Deacon St. John. You make Deacon <laughs> St. John. You make Aloy. You, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you make Joel or whatever. Now, if yeah. you're, there's some stories you can only tell with a character like that. Yeah. And there's absolutely situations like Commander Shepard where they do a really good job of like, or Geralt even, yeah. where like they are characters, they mm -hmm. are a certain way, and you can very much have a bit of agency in your own playthrough, your own portrayal mm -hmm. of that character. So it's not to say that those things are bad, it's to say it's really good that Elden Ring is helping show in a very yep. high sales way that uh, you know the, this way also works. Yeah, because people who play video games now actually, now that it's a new and novel thing, they want an adventure, they want to feel immersed in a world. They don't want to feel immersed in a, in a list of chores, which is like going from playing 30 hours of Forbidden West and then immediately playing uh, <laughs> 60 hours of Elden Ring in the same time frame as those 30 hours. It is, the one thing I wanted to say is that the focus on the score, right? The focus on the score is like 97 Metacritic's proof that reviewers don't care about game UX. They do, but the one thing that I think they're missing is that Horizon Forbidden West as a game feels utterly soulless. There's a lot of care and attention put into like almost every part of it, but it doesn't feel like anything. It doesn't matter to you all that much. There's a lot of dialogue. You're like, yeah, this dialogue's carefully written. All oh, this is, you know, well put together, but you never feel anything. And then you play Elden Ring and you're just constantly because there's no there's nothing reminding you that this is a video game yeah you're just consistently in there everything that happens is you can feel like the unified vision that was this creative endeavor and, and I, I would sense say, of joy is unbelievable in the world like if you strip back loads of that quest design strip yeah. back loads of that ui and ux yeah there's a chance that you could feel a lot more one with aloy that's exactly exactly it uh forbidden west and Elden ring are so so similar in so many ways but they feel completely different because all of this ux and ui and good experience is laid on top because good experience is like some of it is designed to reduce friction some of it's designed to make it approachable and accessible and stuff like you know having your focus beep so you can see every um you know all the handholds climbing up a up the mountain stuff like that or you know just all of the waypoints everything pointing you directly to where you need to go uh, the like here's a highlight a track so you follow this track and it's all like you know you you've never actually even Ghost of Tsushima is a different a different uh, category of this right so uh, if you need to find something in say Elden Ring an NBC will say something like ah the hidden west path and you'll have to figure that out that's like zero information that is yeah. go run around the world Ghost of Tsushima whenever you were tracking something you f you actually followed footprints on the ground. And that was like that was interesting enough to me. Then you play Forbidden West, and you see you see one like set of footprints, and then Aloy says, "Maybe I could use my focus to find something." You turn on the focus, you highlight tracks, and then you see a big purple glowy marker that you just follow until you get to the point. And that's the thing where that's obviously they try to make that in world is the focus doing a lot of the work, and that massively removes anything that. You are your player are engaging with. You're not using yeah, your brain. You're, you're not, not tracking. Yeah, you're not using your brain. You're not tracking. You're not trying. <clears throat> it's, it's really this is almost a fucking meta commentary yeah. on Horizon because a lot of Horizon is thinking about technology's role in things yeah. and how we messed it up. Yeah. So it is quite funny that the technology in Horizon is uh, you know you could almost say making it more making it feel more gamey yeah. and actually making it feel less like you are Aloy and you are tracking something because the technology's done it for you. It, it even has that impact in game. They ne like this isn't a part of the story. This is something I felt when I was playing. Every time someone you know lauds Aloy as this hero, you're just like, oh yeah, that, okay, whatever, that's fine. Um, so much of what she does is enabled by, and this is kind of the the whole uh, chosen one fated hero thing kind of uh, coming into it, where it's like, no, well, she didn't do any of that. That's all because of the focus that she found, luckily, when she was a kid. Obviously, she's like doing things like combat herself and whatnot. But even then, it's like, 
you know, she has access to so much information and, you know, all the NPCs are like, ah, Aloy, we hear you have a second sight. And it's so much of it feels like Aloy's done, done plenty. But the thing that's making her special is the fact that she has all of these focus uh, stuff, all this, like, technology stuff. And then that bleeds into the players. You're like, what am I doing? It's just a, a fucking waypoints leading me around and I'm not actually doing anything. It's all just being just guided for me, which so is... Ugh. Quest design, right? Yeah. So we've we've got Blake here is the one who is uh, <laughs> you know protected his Twitter, yeah. saying nor quest design. Now, this is something that we can talk about because Blake is a senior quest designer. Now, this would be I think a little bit like a senior narrative person at Blizzard yeah. tweeting shade at Final Fantasy XIV mm -hmm. because you know Blizzard story was punctuated by a big CG cinematic. Yeah. And they can't understand, you know, it would be like that. Yeah. Right? So, what what does this mean saying nor quest design? What is he getting at? What is the steel man of his position of what Forbidden West does that is apparently so much better and so much more designed, and that's the thread we're going to pick up later, <laughs> than, than Elven Ring? Right. So, uh, I'll use a... See, this is a problem. I don't remember any exceedingly good examples of Forbidden West questing, but to argue for it, it's, you know, uh, I'm trying to think. It's even just the, the, the best examples I can sort of come to mind are just the ones that you like. The salvage stuff, as an example, is a pretty decent set of like side quest stuff you do, which is go... Here's where here's where an, a mob is. Here's a good reason you need to go get it because the salvager needs this specific item to make this specific purpose. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of context for your quest. And then the quest is, you know, go, you know, read this, uh, read this contract. There's a marker on your map then to go to. You go there and then the UI will tell you, Aloy will say, oh, I should read the thing to make sure I know what I'm doing. But the UI will tell you anyway. And you've got this usual case of, okay, well, you show up, uh, there's... I think they're called uh, Grace Horns, if they're called, mm. or Lance Horns, Lance Horns. And they're these things that are running around in a, in a big circle in a pack, and you have to pick them off one by one and get uh, specifically... No, for those, you just take them all down at once. And it's difficult because they're constantly patrolling really fast, so it feels interesting, it feels like it has a purpose, it has context. And it's actually, gameplay design-wise, it's actually a pretty good quest to do, because you have to, you know... Whereas you can... Most, most other enemies are, like, vaguely static... This one specifically, you need to mount up and chase them down. And it feels really good being like a mounted archer, picking them off. And I think that's a pretty okay quest. Mm. And most other quests are like really fairly clean in terms of, oh, go do this for this reason. And they're satisfying enough little things to tick off. And I think that's like, they're all designed fairly, fairly simply, but fairly well. Yeah. And they often bring you around like exploration zones fairly nicely as well, especially main quest things. There's one towards the end of the game over in the, like, further west. And everything's just like, oh, this environment's really cool. The setup we've got here is really cool. And I'm, like, interestingly going through this ruin, finding, like, uh, the person you're with is delivering decent dialogue. And all it's all pretty nicely done. That would be, like, the, the it's really clean. It's really easy to do. It's enjoyable. There's challenging gameplay. There's different ways to, uh, like approach a specific uh, combat section all that stuff is like really good questing in forbidden west so is it correct to say mm -hmm. i'm going to set this up right is it correct to say that yes quest design the quests are more designed yes however questing mm -hmm. which is the actual like the verb of player gameplay is less designed because the questing Forbidden West is going and doing a bunch of quests. Yeah. Whereas the questing of Elden Ring is yourself exploring and tying together hints and threads yeah. to carve your own path, meaning that the whole thing is your own personal quest. Well, yeah. So, And that's the difference in result player experience. Yeah. Well, to argue from, you know, I'm... I'm going to take the role of Blake playing. I'm designing a bunch of quests that I think are mm. good for accessibility, good for approachability, fun to play, and stuff like that. Then I'm going to go and try and play Elden Ring and think about the quests. Okay. Uh, I did something that I did earlier in the game and had no no possible hint of what it could maybe have uh, you know resulted in later on. But there's an NPC you interact with. I interacted with this NPC later on, and there was a new option, which was to talk to them. 
and they asked me for a favor after giving me some exposition. They asked me for a favor, which was take this broken dagger and give it to its rightful owner. I have no idea who owned the dagger. They didn't tell me. The dagger had no item description, or it had an item description, but it didn't help me figure out what it was whatsoever. I was talking to random NPCs, and then one of them said, oh, that's my dagger. And I was like, wait, oh no, sorry, they didn't say it was mine. They said, oh, I know who that belongs to. And I was like, wait, what? Okay, I, I don't know how this worked. So the quest started with no clear point. There was no way to figure out that was a quest in the first place. It just sort of happened. Then the next step just sort of happened as well because I had no idea who owned the dagger or where it was going to go. I had maybe one clue in how it looked like, but I wasn't able to piece it together. And then that handing that dagger in had unintended consequences that changed the way my game was going to go. And I had no idea any, any step of this way. It was completely arcane, completely obtuse. And I don't know how anyone who's working at a AAA game firm could, underst- could uh, allow that to happen to a player because I had a very, very weird experience possibly a negative one in terms of my plans for the game because an npc that i wanted to work with is now dead because of things that i didn't understand was a quest and that sounds bad but that was incredible because i was like oh shit because now all of these npcs all of these moving parts of the world that i don't see aren't gamified to me and it feels extremely real because there was npcs with completely hidden motivations on both sides of these two NPCs uh, being against each other, I had no idea of my role in it, but I did set wheels in motion, and I was being tricked by NPCs involved. There's a very basic thing, show don't tell, in narrative, and I think when your UI and your quest flow Mm -hmm. is so heavily telling the player what to do, then you rob the player of having the click. Yeah. And I think you all, like, we all know this, those moments when a game clicks... Hmm when a bit of narrative design has just been really smartly done yeah. so that it doesn't click in the game UI and then you see it and then you, you're like, okay, I understand that yeah, now. No you're pop-up. like, I understand. Yeah, the, this this wasn't a pop-up telling me I'd completed a quest. This was, I was in a place I'd been before. There was a new door open. I walked in and I saw these NPCs, one of them dead. And I was like, oh, holy shit. What if I, oh, 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 I understand everything now. I was being tricked the whole time. Shit, nice. I thought that was such in- so incredible. There are so many other examples as well. Like there's there's a bit where you there's someone you completely miss, but you talk to them and they send you off on this quest that deals with uh, solving this like really really important to the world problem. But you solve one tiny instance of it, then you have to figure out how to take that tiny instance, complete that NPC's quest line, and bring that to a wider conclusion. But you, at no point are you railroaded. It is literally some. You meet one NPC who goes, "Uh, yeah, could you go get this thing and bring it to this woman?" You're like, "Okay, sure." You don't know exactly where either of them are. You yeah. go, you go and do, you go and do them, and then that woman's like, "Oh, cheers, see you later then." And then at other points of the game, with no hint, that NPC will be there. And that's an awful experience if you're trying to 100% complete this game and understand every quest line. But if you're playing the game naturally, it feels incredible to go, where could this character be? I'll go look for them because I have an idea of how the themes in this game are put, being pulled together. No one said, oh, the Scarlet Rot originated from here and is moving through the world here and ultimately ends up here causing all these problems. I see it all happen. And this is in, this comes as part of me reading item descriptions fighting different bosses, exploring different places, and all of that culminating in understanding and following this quest line to its logical conclusion. I think that's to say there's a massive difference between adventuring, a Mm -hmm. form of gameplay, and then how that's achieved. Elden Ring has achieved that by actually giving you an adventure to go on where you're the adventurer. Yeah, it's not a video game. And like things that an event... Yeah, so you had a genuine adventure in a virtual world as opposed to being dipped in to an ever-expanding map icon thing where apparently an adventure yeah. is seeing all of the little attractions that have yep. been created for you to enjoy. Yeah. And this is where we get on to basically Ubisoft have destroyed video games. <laughs> and here's Alex, an ex Ubisoft developer who worked there for like 10 years, mm-hmm. quote tweeting this and, uh, and being like, okay, well, here's my thought. And it's mm-hmm. always good to see the people who have came out the other side of this and have actually learned and understood. Because I think sometimes what happens is, uh, well, 
as games turn into this massive production, it's like mm -hmm. everyone's just focused on their little bit. Yes. And they think that, oh, what a, what a quest designer does is they design quests. And we even see that, like a great example <laughs> for us in, in World of Warcraft, mm -hmm. the people who just get assigned to designing the little small bits, they do a brilliant, beautiful job. Yeah. And it's like none of the creativity that's went into that has went into the overall macro narrative and player experience. So if we get into this, Alex saying, as an ex-Ubisoft developer who I was with for almost 10 years, I am not with those sentiments at all. Let it be heard. Sorry. Yes, let it be heard. Let it be noted that I lament greatly and with satisfaction that the Ubisoft formula that is per, uh, permeated into all major AAA open world games. And let me tell you, the Ubisoft formula has fucking destroyed so many games for me. The second I see the Ubi formula, I'm just like, ah, gone. Yep. Can't really play and enjoy Assassin's Creed anymore. Connell, who's editing this very video, the way that he's been able to enjoy these Assassin's Creeds is basically by putting blinders on himself <laughs> so he doesn't have to get what, what Alex here is talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's what he says. He says that it is tired and rote from quest design to ux everything about it i just hate that every major triple a open world game has the same quest design has the same checkpointing has the same waypointing all the same bells and whistles and i just wish it would stop i am thankful for a game like breath of the wild which was doing a good job of breaking that mold though it still had its hands you uh, know in the ubisoft formula and now elden ring pushing as the antithesis to the standard open world format lastly i enjoy all the games i'm going to list but there's definitely a problem when they all feel so samey. Ghost of Tsushima, Assassin's Creed, Horizon, Halo Infinite, Far Cry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Halo Infinite only got away with it because the combat sandbox was fun, because it's Halo, and because the movement was so fun. If it wasn't for those things, getting around the template would have been boring. Just like with Tsushima. It was able to get around it by being a little bit different. Yeah, it... it it was basically, you know, uh, a, a way to put it is if Horizon Zero Dawn or Forbidden West and Assassin's Creed are like 0 0.0 on like the number line in terms of, or, you know, and then you want to go from 0 to 10 in terms of easily designed and uh, an actual adventure world, Ghost of Tsushima was like baby steps on it. Baby steps that are, okay, well, we'll make it more immersive. So instead of a, a big glowing waypoint marker, we'll have a gust of wind guiding you. And then that feels a little immersive. We'll have the little foxes guide you to the Inari Shrines. You know, we'll have you actually following foot footprints. We'll have all that stuff that made it feel a little bit more like a world. But that was like one step down this path. Elden Ring just sprinted the whole way to the end and went, yeah. no, we're over here where you're not going to know what's going on and you're going to love every second of it. And here's how you design some of this shit. You take you actually take some inspiration for what people really wanted from Skyrim mods. Yeah. So here, here's what I'm going to say, right? How does Halo Infinite feel like a, a unique, cool sandbox? Well, you see those things are little markers that are tightly designed. Mm. Yeah. All oh, gone. What you do is you make there be a genuine war between the banished yeah. and uh, and the UNSC. You put it there and you make dynamic game systems to make the open world feel alive and actually match the fantasy. Because yeah. the fantasy of being a lone samurai in an occupied place, of being Master Chief, of, you know, being in Horizon, they're different fantasies. In Horizon, why do we not have dynamic herds going across the zone? Why do we not have like predator prey relationships and shit like that well, but, actually yeah, yeah. playing out where instead of doing these, you know, tightly designed little quests, how about we try to make these things more dynamic, mm. make them actually just play more of a, a role in the world. That, yeah. That's what I keep on thinking about. It's what keeps on disappointing See, me. Yeah. So this is the thing that I think interesting, right? You say, why don't we have all these dynamic systems? that do all this stuff and then you think well obviously that's hard to do and that's hard to design that's hard to you know guarantee and prove that there is something here this is the magic trick that people uh, i mean obviously if you played every souls game or if you finish playing elden ring and then look up how everything works together it's not a big dynamic system it's not this incredibly you know super high level genius form of uh you know this creative storytelling machine working beneath the surface it is literally Here's a big world. Here's a big series of quests and steps. Th that's the thing that I think people will struggle to kind of grasp. Quest design is the same. Here's a series of steps. It's how the steps unfold and how they feel to you that's really different. Yeah. And that's the thing where I don't think any of those dynamic systems are actually needed to get a, a much better experience. Because 
and this is what video games have been doing for a long time in terms of worlds. They've been pretending all that shit's happening. They've been faking it all by just going complex enough with their static elements and what they change. They don't have to go, well, we'll read, we'll... Will just build an entire ecology of robot dinosaurs. They just go. Here's a couple of scripted events and a whole bunch of stuff. You see it in the right time. You feel good. That would be the the possible option. But I mean, how much of it is just production? Then been like, ah, yeah. we we have to get X content. We have to get a sixty hour game. So fire in a load of quests. And you're like, okay, well, I guess I can get the narrative team to throw in some cool lore, and people will have fun shooting the dinos. I guess it's like what I just what I crave for yeah. is these open worlds matching their fantasy, not in terms of content design, yeah. but in terms of like, you know, the overall design. Yeah. Because questing in Halo Infinite, questing in Tsushima, questing in Horizon, mm -hmm. questing in Elden Ring, that's the, it's like the same player verb, it, different, different means, it should be achieved by different means in each game. And yeah. so many of the games just choose the same means, and then they, you know, the same means, but they make theme specific content. Yeah. And I'm just trying to work out, like, what are the different ways that this can be done? Um, Ubisoft found a formula, and I think what happened is, and this is the thing we can learn from Ubisoft as we draw this video to a close, how many people work in Assassin's Creed games? Like, the teams are absolutely ginormous. Yeah. So Ubisoft made a formula tailor-designed for large productions where you can just bolt on a support studio, bolt on more people. Yep. And maybe that's not the ideal way. I mean, that's... That's the ideal way yeah. for how they make their, yeah, their games. Yeah, that, that's the thing. The way these games are made, and they're, they're made with a degree of technical excellence as well, because outside of a couple bugs, Forbidden West is a substantially better game than Elden Ring. As far as most, uh, as far as most like, oh, I see how you've made this. It's just, it's better. But Elden Ring is a substantially better player experience in almost every conceivable way. Outside of being, you know, obtuse and difficult and hard to understand which ultimately i think works for uh the player experience of players who are going to stick with it because it is a, a difficult game that doesn't give you any quarter but it makes you feel that way because that's how the world's supposed to feel whereas it you know aloy walking around feeling like you know oh what's that a 30 foot dinosaur i'll just sort it out with a couple bow and a, with, with a bow and a couple arrows and that's the whole thing where one of them's an experience of soul and the other's a uh video game product that's been made by video game product creating people, much in the same way you would make software. Where it's like, here's, yeah, everything, everything is technically perfect, but nothing has a soul. And it's, I mean, makes sense. How are you gonna, how are you gonna put a, you know, put millions or, you know, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars behind something that has, you know, something as ephemeral as a soul. But I think that's why everyone, you know, played video games, not for technically excellent, time wasting experiences yeah but for adventures for feeling for soul and, the thing, and the that's the thing, thing that that's what dark souls did in 2011 that it, that enraptured so many players and elden ring has just done the exact same thing again because elden ring is just big dark souls it's just very big and has an open world i think what happened though is graphics this is that this would be the thing we've yeah. lamented for so long yeah graphics sell games so we start to innovate and we start to push on those things yeah. And often, you, you know, it's almost like graphics is innovated more than, you know, actual Gameplay? art style and design yeah. more. So we kind of have these like super big, super expensive worlds. Mm -hmm. We're all just trying to make big games that are bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's like all of these incentives and all of the way that like, how do you scale up games? Mm -hmm. Like one of the things people love about indies is, you know, small team, charming game. Yeah. It's harder to do that when you have so many people. Yep. So I, I just think it's. Oh, it's beautiful that the other way is being shown, isn't it? Yeah, and I think uh, this being, uh, you know, for, for everything you could say about Elden Ring being, you know, whatever, in terms of, ah, uh, it's inaccessible and people are finding it really difficult and it's, uh, you know, people are refunding it because they're getting wrecked and stuff like that. This being part of the conversation gives me so much hope. That said, I think it was Jez Corden of Windows Central tweeted, uh, I can't wait for a load of AAA studios to completely shallowly try to do what Elden Ring does and completely miss the point. Because that's the thing about production. That's the thing about creativity. You can't manufacture souls. Yeah. You can certainly try. But I think we've proven everything that, you know, it just doesn't really happen. It's over over design. Yeah. Over design ends up happening because you get a designer and a designer thinks they have to design by designing more. <laughs> yeah. And you look at, say, rewards design in World of Warcraft. You look oh, at yeah. system design in World of Warcraft. And it's like, clearly, these are designers trying to design something. Mm -hmm. But actually, the way to design 
the end result that you want is to design less. Mm. And in that less, you get more if you've designed the less well. Yeah, well, you don't just add, 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 add. Yeah, so I think the, the thing you need to do, and this is obviously coming from the perspective of not having worked in AAA video games, but you see level design. Where level design is a thing where you design a level. That's all the design you really need. <laughs> you design a level. You don't design specific, hyper, super specific bits of things here and there. All you need is a really, really nice world, a really, really nice level, a general sense of, you know, because you need people to design all your uh, abilities, all your combat, all your weapon stuff. And then you have those working tandem, then you're done. You don't need to design interesting, insane rewards. You know how uh, uh, Elden Ring rewards you a lot of the time? Literally, uh, a load of shit you probably won't need, but it's cool to have, so you don't really feel too rewarded, or an item that uh, up that lets you up, you know, the materials to upgrade your weapons. That's it. You know, uh, one of the first things my uh, housemate said to me whenever he saw me on the horse torrent, he's like, "Oh, can you get? Oh, can you get? You know, cosmetics or skins for the for the horse?" And I was like, "I fucking hope not." Yeah, that's what I said, and I meant it. And that's it. There's no, whenever I'm exploring stuff, it's entirely for intrinsic purposes. Even the times where I literally went to get the upgrade material specifically, I started to feel, oh, I'm playing this like a video game. Pull back. Let's go walk over to this corner of the map because I haven't been there yet and see what's there. And that's what's just made the thing so much, so much more interesting. Yeah, I think it's hard to overstate how video game reward systems have mm. like killed, say the feeling of childlike exploration from yeah. playing a Zelda for the very first time. Yep. But as time has went on, everything has been RPGified in the worst way, yeah. where it's role, what does RPG mean? Does it mean role playing game? Or, or does, does it mean, it mean <laughs> number go up, bing, bing, wahoo, reward design, loot system, etc., etc. And I think what we've worked out is that it's pretty easy yeah. to use basic Skinner box psychology to get players to just be happy little rats in a maze. Whereas I think there is, you know, there is a braver route. There is mm -hmm. a harder route to making a game that can be perhaps more poignant to less people. And I think that, I mean, it's, I think it's better art personally. Yep, and that's uh, yeah. to get to the, I mean, almost the final point mm -hmm. of why these developers are just thinking like, oh my God, we are, we are objectively so good and so polished. How did they get a better Metacritic rating than us? <laughs> because it's rating an artistic experience that is enjoyed by people. And that's it. Yeah, there it's are, not objective. It's not objective. It's Games are art. Yeah, it's a subjective of your, your experience playing it. And that's, I mean, I'll... Uh, I'll end on a bit of an anecdote because there's one thing that I really hit me like a brick when I was uh, in the last session I was playing Elden Ring. So I was uh, definitely towards the very end of the game and I, there was a... Uh, you know the way you see enemies and you think about them? Or rather you don't think about them? Yeah. They're just enemies in your way. I turned a corner and I saw a chest that was being guarded by three very specific enemies that have been quite mysterious to me so far. And then I, you know, I, I took took a lot of time, killed them. It was a fun little designed encounter because there were, you know, specific matches of abilities and uh, stuff I had to deal with. Dealt with them, got the chest, opened the chest, saw the item in it, which was a weapon. Didn't care about using the weapon, but I was I immediately sat back in my chair, I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." Immediately checked the item description, and a whole bunch of different things in my head started to click because the way they designed the whole thing was that weapon was a reward. But it wasn't a reward because it went, oh, more damage. I went, that's an interesting bit of lore because it was, it, it, it told me a story about the world, just what this weapon was. It told me a story about how everything in this world ties together with elements that aren't from it and stuff like that. And the, I can't remember the last time I've played a game and opening a chest has made me go, oh, I'm really glad I did that. And I think that tells you everything you need to know. Yeah. Because... You put that story together. You got that story. Mm -hmm. <sighs> it's just like, you know, some people saying a book is better than reading. You know, a book is better than a movie because, you know, it activates their imagination. Yep. And uh, yeah, there's, there's just lessons to learn. So look, there we go. I think that as, you know, as much as, you know, you can see something like this and it's like, okay, we're just going to clown on you because that's yeah. fucking stupid. <laughs> uh, but ultimately... There is so much that can be learned from this, and uh, I, I hope that's really what's went on today. Yep. Certainly gets us all thinking. Let me know though, what's your uh, what's your experience been, and if you've played both of these games, how do they compare uh, for you? 
And with that, we'll see you next time.